Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. Today we're taking a deep dive into the Supreme Court's Van Buren decision, which was issued earlier this month. The aim of this decision was to clarify the ambiguous meaning of exceeding authorised access in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the federal computer crime law enacted all the way back in 1986. Within that decision, there is plenty to discuss, including what impact it may have on the protection of critical infrastructure against hackers, and how this particular ruling will define how organizations and businesses manage, report, and handle unauthorized access. It also raises some foundational questions that, if weighed carefully, have the potential to foster a collaborative relationship between researchers and companies. Could this decision potentially inform how ethical security researchers, acting in good faith and with the public interest in mind, should conduct themselves? Could it lead to a scenario in which every researcher is in violation of the CFAA if they access a system without first obtaining permission? To bring some clarity and context to the Van Buren decision, I am joined today by two legal experts, Jared L. Hubbard, partner at Fitch LP, and Christopher Hart, partner, co-chair, privacy and data security practice in Boston for Foley Hogue LLP. Both gentlemen have followed this ruling closely and worked on amicus briefs to aid the court in making their decision. Jared and Christopher, thank you for joining us today. Let's start with the man at the center of this decision who, despite his name, is not a European techno producer. Chris, can you introduce us to Nathan Van Buren and give us an overview of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act? Well, sir, thanks very much. And, uh, and I'm very happy to, to be invited to speak with my good friend, Jared, um, about this case. Um, uh, let me, Sarah, if I could just take a liberty as a panelist to start just with an overview of the CFAA and then turn it to Jared to talk about uh, Mr. Van Buren. Um, <laughs> then, uh, that, if you wouldn't mind the liberty, um, my taking the liberty. So just, just to lay, lay the foundation here, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act um, is essentially a federal anti-hacking statute. Um, and as Sarah pointed out, uh, the first version of the law was passed in 1986. There have been a number of amendments since then, in 1989, 1994, 2000, 1996, 2001, 2002, 2008, a recent one last year. It keeps getting amended, but there are a couple of core elements um, that are critically important to, um, to understanding the CFAA. Um, and in order to talk about the, those, um, it's important to understand that before Congress passed the law, um, the traditional property and criminal statutes like trespass or burglary had proven to be poor vehicles to regulate virtual spaces. Um, they were aimed really towards physical spaces. Um, Sorry, I'm realizing there's an echo and I'm trying to, to mitigate it. So I'm uh, sorry about that. Um, hopefully that, that helped. Um, the, the reason that those are difficult statutes or uh, theories of law to use against computer harms is that they tend to rely on physical space or physical uh, entry. So trespass has relied primarily on the idea of having a physical body in a space, an actual physical space. Same with burglary, same, same sort of idea, theft of, of some kind of physical property. And so Congress recognized this, but before Congress recognized it, a bunch of states had recognized it. So Florida passed something in 1978, uh, specifically about computer trespass. Um, Vermont was the last state to do so in 1999, a bunch of states in between. Um, and, so, uh, and so it's important to understand that context. And that's why we're talking about the CFA in the first, first place. What the CFA does is prohibit, it creates violations around unauthorized access. That's an actual term in the statute. What, uh, if, if somebody has unauthorized access to a computer, then the CFA creates a violation around that. Or you can exceed authorized access. So this idea of unauthorized access or exceeding authorized access are really the two main components of the CFAA. Um, so the question is, what counts? What me? What makes access unauthorized? What makes uh, access uh, having exceeded um, authorization? That's really what the Van Buren case is about. Because before the Supreme Court decided this case, there was a circuit split. 
about what what constituted authorized or unauthorized access. So is it enough that uh, you violate the terms of service of or a policy around use of files? Is misuse enough? Or is it simply the physical access to some kind of computer uh, system uh, that counts and not a violation of a policy or a violation of terms of service? There's a big split among the circuits around this issue um, and Van Buren uh, resolved, at least to some extent, some of that. So Jared, why don't you take it away with Mr. Van Buren? Mr. Van Buren was actually, he was a police sergeant in Cummings, Georgia, and he got involved um, with a gentleman who was a little shady and uh, and essentially tried to shake him down for money. Well, so his, his friend then went to the police and got involved with the FBI and they agreed that they would, uh, they would approach Mr. Van Buren and say, we'll pay you $5,000 for you to access the license plate database, the police license plate database and provide information so that I can confirm that, that uh, this person is not a, uh, an undercover, that I'm dealing with is not an undercover poli police officer. And he did that and he provided and the FBI, it was sort of an FBI setup, but the FBI had created this record um, that, that he accessed in his police cruiser and, and provided them to the FBI. They arrested him and they charged him. And one of the things that they charged him with was exceeding authorized access. There was a police policy in place um, that said that you can only use the police records database for police use. You're not allowed to use it for personal use or anything like that. And so the, um, he was uh, tried and convicted actually of a violation of the Computer Fraud Abuse Act for exceeding the authorized access with the argument being that because he had violated this policy and used the database for improper purposes uh, under this policy, that was illegal. The 11th Circuit upheld that and, and upheld his conviction for that. And it went up to the Supreme Court, which then um, you know, had to determine whether or not the, pol the, the underlying policy here was enough to say, okay, you've exceeded authorized access because you violated um, you know, an employer's policy. Okay, and so how does the Van Buren case and the CFAA impact technology companies considered, considered to be critical infrastructure? What the court ultimately determined was that this was not a violation. The court and, and the court laid down a very bright line rule. So the government's argument was essentially that if you violate a policy, if you access a computer for improper purposes, then that is not going to be, or then that's going to be illegal. The court said no, that that's not enough. What what um, it, it sort of categorized it into three separate categories. The first is is outside hackers, and, and Chris talked about um, accessing computers without authorization. If you have no authorization to access a computer and you hack or access that computer, that's going to be a violation of the CFAA. The second one is is inside hackers. So. Um, if I uh, work at a company, but I don't have access to certain files, um, you know, I have access to a computer, to a server, and have access to a certain set of files, but not to another set. Um, you know, if there's a database that I'm not supposed to access, and I access that database, that's a violation of the CFAA. Then, then there's the, the idea of these sort of insiders like Van Buren who have legitimate access to a database and then use it for improper purposes. And the court said essentially that that is not a violation of the CFAA. Violations of these policies or, or sort of the purpose violations are not violations of the CFAA. So in terms of, you know, in terms of how that impacts computer security and critical infrastructure, the real um, risk there, and I think the, the, what the court made clear is it set a real black line uh, rule in terms of if you're accessing areas on the computer that are off limits, that you're not supposed to be accessing, that is going to be a violation of the CFAA and a criminal, uh, a criminal act. If, on the other hand, you're given access, you know, you have public access and, you know, or you're an insider, say you, you know, you, um, you know, an, are an operator at a, a nuclear facility or a bank and you have general wide access to the database, you know, using that for an illegitimate purpose, doing something wrong on that is not a violation of the CFAA. It may be a violation of other laws, but it's not going to be a violation of the CFAA. So was he guilty of a crime, just a different crime? <laughs> well, he certainly wasn't guilty of the CFAA. Um, and, and I think, you know, Jared did a great job, I think, talking about what the doctrinal outcome is of the case. But I, but I do think it's important to, to emphasize that um, the court was very clear that all we're talking about here is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. We're talking about a specific criminal statute and whether... Uh, 
an action that exceeds the, the scope or the, the uh, intended use that an individual might, um, might have is not going to become a criminal violation under the CFAA. One of the things that's interesting to me about this is that, that there have been, I've had, I've certainly had clients who have wondered, uh, and I think this was sort of in your question, Sarah, like, well, what can we do then to protect ourselves, right? Well, you, a lot of companies are already doing the things that they need to do to protect themselves. You know, there were, the, the, the court really didn't say anything about whether there's other, uh, some other um, legal theory, um, either criminal or civil, uh, that, uh, that, that companies can employ in the event that there's been some misuse of data. Um, but the court, and this, is, this has been generally true of the Supreme Court when they look at federal criminal statutes, is that there's a real reluctance to want to expand criminal uh, statutes um, to encompass a wide variety of different behavior because Congress's jurisdiction, uh, criminal jurisdiction, is at least in theory supposed to be limited. Now, the thing that I want to say here is that we're talking about this in the criminal context because that's the case in which that's the case that the court decided. But the CFA is both a criminal statute and a civil statute. So all of the the, the, the CFA actually defines seven types of crime um, that, that involve access to or unauthorized access to a computer. Um, those also can form the basis for a civil cause of action. So if you've got a private entity, um, you know, let's say you've got a, 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 a competitor that steals trade secrets, right? Um, maybe the CFA can be used as a way to get damages, to get money. Um, or to get some kind of injunctive relief um, based on uh, based on that same activity. So the court's decision is about the scope of the CFAA, not just as a criminal statute, but also um, in its in its civil use. Um, but but really took pains to make sure um, that that it was narrowed. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways to think about um, protecting information. Thank you, Jared. I there were multiple amicus briefs submitted to the Supreme Court um, when they were making their decision. Um, can you explain why the mobile voting company vote submitted brief and um, briefly what their main argument was? This is one of the first cases the Supreme Court, I, I may be actually the first case, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, where the Supreme Court really addressed the CFAA. And so it was a very important case in terms of determining, um, you know, what is, how the CFAA is interpreted, um, and it did that, but one of the one of the interesting things there were, there were a group of security researchers um, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation that submitted an amicus brief um, with Van Buren on basically arguing for a very narrow interpretation of the CFAA and and arguing that that security researchers you know not it, it wasn't you know entirely clear but basically should have a safe harbor for sort of you know, good acts done by um, by security researchers in trying to identify um, security vulnerabilities, and um, so in and and votes was mentioned in that, and, and election security was mentioned in that, and so votes wanted to put in a brief, uh, not so much to argue for the um, for the purpose, uh, you know, argument that the government was arguing, but to explain how how this you know this safe safe harbor for security researchers would work, and that in that um, you know, it is very difficult, as I understand it, to to determine if you are being, you know, if people are trying to have to make unauthorized access under your systems, you don't know whether or not those are, you know, white hat security researchers or black hat hackers. You don't, you know, you can't tell from, you know, from the IP address whether or not that's a Russian, you know, a Russian um, firm trying to, you know, hack elections, or if it's, you know, someone from from a university. And so we wanted to make that point very clear that. You know, the proper way to do this type of security research is in concert with the companies and with the clients to ensure that this, these are properly done, that it's not sort of attacks on an active live system, you know, particularly during things like an ongoing election or, you know, trying to trying to hack, um, you know, critical infrastructure like dams or or nuclear power plants in the midst of their operation. And so there is a, a sort of a, a proper way of doing this. And that the CFAA should not be interpreted so narrowly or, or provide some safe harbor that allows for you know very broad access without and, and this sort of 
you know, essentially a purpose argument on the other side that as long as there's a legitimate purpose or, or what they view as a legitimate, legitimate purpose, there's no crime involved. And so we, we feel like the court really, um, we agree with the way the court did it in, in interpreting a very sort of black line rule that if you're, if you're getting into areas of a computer that, you're, that are off limits that you shouldn't have access to, that's going to be what's covered by the CFAA. Purpose doesn't enter into it from, from one side in terms of having an improper purpose or from the other from having a proper purpose. Thank you. So should an ethical security researcher have to declare their intentions? And if so, at what point in the research process should they be doing that? I'm happy to jump in and then Jared, if you want to, you want to, you want to chime in. So, so I think the, the question of um, how should researchers act in light of Van Buren um, is uh, interesting in this respect. Because what Van Buren did was say it is not a violation of the statute to um, uh, to access uh, computer files or computer systems um, to which you have authorization, um, even if you uh, might be in violation of a policy or terms. Um, I, I think the question is, you know, I'm thinking of this from a litigator's perspective. What's the risk analysis? Um, what, how should you think about the potential risk? Um, you know, Jared made the point that there should be uh, work that's done in concert, right? There should be cooperative work um, that's done, and then you can avoid uh, the possibility of violating terms and policies. Um, but what Van Buren is saying is that whether you're violating terms and policies or whether you're violating in violation of some other law, um, that's not a CFAA violation. Um, so, you know, I think, I, I think that the, the answer to the question in part is a question of, well, what are, the, what are the appropriate ways to conduct research and what are the risks involved in doing so? One of the risks that's frankly off the table is the risk of criminal liability under the CFAA. Jared, I wonder if you see it the same way. I agree. And I think that, you know, one of the things that the court was very concerned with, um, with the idea of sort of violation of terms of service um, and sort of improper use of computers uh, constituting a violation to the CFAA was, um, was that it would vastly expand sort of the criminal reach of the statute beyond what, what the court considered to be acceptable. And, and that, you know, you think of, you know, if you go and work for an employer, you know, the employer may have a policy, you know, computers are to be used for work use and not for personal use. And the court was concerned that, okay, well, if you send a personal email or you access your bank account online or you some, you know, or you even surf the internet, right? Um, you know, looking at a website, that that could be, you have access to that computer, but you've used it for an improper purpose and therefore that's a CFAA violation. So that, you know, the court wanted to make very clear that that is not a violation. That's not what's covered by the statute. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, you know, that's something to keep in mind here. Uh, and it, it's not that that was leading to a lot of prosecutions, but there was there was some uh, chilling effect in terms of how uh, you know how people would act regarding terms of service uh, prior to this this judgment. Yeah, I think Amy Coney Barrett, when she read out the ruling, mentioned how it could affect people um, perhaps embroidering the truth a bit on their online dating profiles. <laughs> Although uh, I think I've got many single friends who would think that guys that pretend to be over six foot tall and who aren't maybe deserve to get punished. <laughs> you know, Sarah, Sarah, on that point, on that point, I, I do want to read a quote from the um, from the opinion just on that on that uh, on that point. What what Barrett wrote in her opinion was the government's interpretation of the statute would attach criminal penalties to a breathtaking amount of commonplace computer activity. If the exceeds authorized access clause criminalizes every violation of computer use policy, then millions of otherwise law-abiding citizens are criminals. Um, I think that this was absolutely, if you read the opinion, it, it was absolutely top of mind of the majority to think about what the policy implications would be of making Van Buren's conduct a CFAA violation. Um, and, and one thing I want to I wanna, um, hasten to add is that there are, there, there are seven, seven distinct violations, right? Many of them are in the, in, the, um, in the phraseology knowing or intentional or reason to believe. So for many of these, there is an element of intent to defraud 
or intent to cause harm or knowing that you will do so. Um, so uh, that, that, wasn't a that wasn't something that was decided by Van Buren, but it's important to note that Van Buren didn't decide every issue, right? And, and there are questions about intent that are still probably open, and there are other questions we could talk about other, other um, CFA cases that are out there. It really just, just discusses one narrow issue, but, um, but there are other aspects of the statute that are also narrowing in different ways. If it was a law that everyone was guilty of committing, I mean, wouldn't that then be time to change the law completely, right? Because law is an evolving thing and it gets changed, you know, gay marriage changes, um, you know, all these different things that have changed over the years of what's legal and what's illegal. So well, um, and and that'd be quite interesting to see what happened. <laughs> Well, and you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, and that was actually one of the arguments that we made in, in the amicus brief was that, you know, the, the particularly for security researchers who wanted a safe harbor provision for security researchers, that that's not really the court's uh, obligation to sort of write a new, you know, safe harbor provision into the law. If Cong, you know, that is for Congress to do. And, you know, it, it is, as Chris mentioned, I mean, the law is from 1986. Uh, it has been amended several times, but uh, but it is you know from a time that was really pre-internet, and so you know when it talks about computers, I mean it has been interpreted um, to you know refer to the internet and and to be in, you know be interpreted to work with uh, the way things are today. But it was really written before any of that, and and so you know it does probably deserve updating. I don't know that we're going to see any updating from Congress uh, anytime soon, particularly given you know how divided Congress is. Uh, although they did, they did uh, just last year, um, you know, for, for purposes of voting, they put in that voting machines are specifically covered by the uh, by the CFAA. Okay, so who would you say the ruling is a win for? Is it a win for companies or researchers or hackers? I think. I mean, it's it is a win for. For, for certain types of illicit users. So for example, um, if, if you have access to a database of information and by the terms of service say you can only access it for certain purposes. So for, Facebook has this in their terms of service that you're only supposed to use it for personal use. People all the time, you know, a lot of companies though try, and I think we had it in, um, you know, some, a lot of news stories about this where they would try to go and basically get a lot of information from Facebook uh, and, you know, in order to be able to sell things or to get, you know, that kind of information from Facebook without paying Facebook for it. Um, those types of uses, if you have access to the database, even if it's improper, and even if you're sort of scraping information from that database that you're not supposed to use for other purposes, that's no longer a violation of the CFAA. And maybe it's going to be a violation of the terms of service. There may be other, um, you know, legal remedies against that type of user, but that's not going to be a criminal violation of the CFAA. Um, and, you know, in terms for companies, it does mean that companies cannot create criminal liability through their terms of service or policies. So it's not, you know, by saying you're not supposed to use a computer in a certain way, um, you have access to it, but you can only use it for certain purposes. That's not going to be a, a criminal act if that sort of policy or term of service is, is violated. On the other hand, I think it makes it very clear what is a violation. Um, here. And that is going to be any, as I said before, I mean, any attempt to access, um, you know, databases or files that are off limits. And one of the big questions that's outstanding for the court and that the court left, uh, and it's in footnote eight of the decision, is the court did not determine whether that, that um, off limits question has to be uh, whether or not it is co a code based limitation. So a password protected file, say that you would have to hack into, or whether you can just say, no, you don't have access to these files. You know, it may be on my system, but I'm not supposed to access, you know, at my work, uh, you know, confidential employee documents. If there's no password protection, but I'm told in the policy, I don't have access to those files, is that going to be enough to have that contractor policy limitation? The court basically punted on that because it ha didn't have to deal with that in this case. And so, you know, that I think is going to be one of the real arguments and things going forward because, uh, you know, and as the, the security researchers explained with, with some of what the security research security researchers do is they try to, um, you know, they do scraping on the internet where they try to, to put in a lot of, on websites, they put in a lot of different um, subdomain addresses so they can see if anything is public that shouldn't be public, um, you know, or anything is publicly accessible that shouldn't be. And that's not really established whether or not that is legal or illegal by this, because yes, it may be that you type in the address and you can get it, but if you're not supposed to be there, 
um, and the, the terms of service say you, you can't access this area, that could be a violation. And so, and that is still unclear uh, under the current law. I just want to say one thing. So the scraping issue uh, is interesting. So um, after Van Buren was decided, the court granted cert in a case called um, High Q versus LinkedIn that was decided by the Ninth Circuit and then remanded it back to the Ninth Circuit um, uh, for for reconsideration in light of Van Buren. I don't know how they're going to reconsider. Basically, High Q is a is a data analytics company that, among other things, scraped uh, information from LinkedIn. LinkedIn uh, information about individuals uh, is largely publicly available. They were scraping the publicly available information, and they were using it for various purposes. Um, the Ninth Circuit ended up deciding uh, that uh, at least it, it, they, they were under standard called likelihood of success. It was a preliminary injunction, so they didn't actually decide the merits, but they said that it was likely um, that, and I'm going um, to quote this, it is likely that when a computer network generally permits public access to its data, a user's accessing that publicly available data will not constitute access without authorization under the CFAA. It's interesting to me that the court remanded this in light of Van Buren because as I think about the logic, this is consistent with, Jared, what you were saying, I don't see how the Ninth Circuit could come to a different decision um, in light of Van Buren. If it's publicly available, then somebody has what, um, what the decision calls gates up access, um, then that should be sufficient. However, it'll be interesting to see what the Ninth Circuit says. And, you know, and all, for all intents and purposes, that question of, of scraping might still be uh, an open one for the court to consider, um, although analytically, I'm not sure how it can be much different. The the footnote nine, um, uh, the footnote eight issue that Jared brings up, which is, you know, we're not we're not going to make any um, we're not going to make any comment about technical access, right? The technological access. Do you have a password? Do you not have a password? Um, it, it, the is inconsistent with the next footnote, footnote nine, um, I think, which says that. Um, authentication is a specific authorization that the statute contemplates. And so the, the reason I bring this up is that I do think that it's going to be an issue that lower courts are going to have to deal with, which is to what extent is the, the issue of access foreclosed or not simply by the question of what do you have technically. And there was recently, um, in, after Van Buren, a district court case in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania where it was a, it's a criminal case. And one of the issues is somebody, somebody basically left their employment. I forget if they were fired or not, um, but they ha still had their password and the password wasn't reset for some time and they still had access. And so the question is, does that count? Is that, is the access authorized or not, right? They still had the password. It clearly was a mistake by the organization that they didn't reset the password, but the person had been fired. And so does that count? So that's going, if that goes to the Third Circuit, that could be an interesting test case on whether um, what the court was saying in footnotes eight and, or footnote nine um, would be sufficient. Now, there are all sorts of other issues in the CFA. I want to make this clear because I do see these questions in the chat. Um, this is one aspect of it. We're just talking about what counts as authorization or excess, exceeds authorization. We're not talking about the other parts of the statute that have to do with intent. Um, uh, we're not talking about the specific violations in the statute. We're just talking about the authorization issue. That's the only thing that Van Buren decided. It didn't say anything about intent. So even if you don't have authorized access, if you had, if you're, if you did not have um, knowing a uh, knowing uh, an intentional um, uh, basis to harm or misuse then you might not be committing a CFA violation. So, so I want to make that make that really clear. So what happens if, say, you accidentally receive an email containing someone else's personal health information? So if you kind of accidentally <laughs> get access to data, would that then not kind of fall under the CFAA because it's not about permission to access it? Yeah, I mean, that, that you know, it might be, uh, you might have some HIPAA obligations, I don't know, but... Uh... <laughs> But it, the CFAA wouldn't, I mean, if, you, if you're just receiving things, um, the CFAA isn't going to apply because you're, you're, you have to access a system or files yourself. Um, you know, and, and Chris talked about the intent element there. And you have to go out and try and access something. And, and generally, you know, and it, while there is this debate between do you need sort of code-based uh, barriers 
or can you just you know prohibit people from from accessing files you know uh, you know in, in contracts or in terms of service and and that suffices well there is that limit you know the the best policy for companies is going to be to have a code based barrier if you don't want people accessing um, certain things you want to put passwords in place you want to have to you know all of the best sort of standard practices two factor authentication all the rest um, in term you know because that's going to provide for organizational safety. And one of the one of the other issues here is that you know the CFAA criminalizes certain conduct, doesn't criminalize others. But you know you also have enforcement. And so even though the government took a very broad view of what the CFAA had and and has taken that broad view for decades, the the amount of enforcement of of CFAA violations that are not really you know hackers, you know that we think of um, in that way is very narrow. I mean, the government just doesn't prosecute people who accidentally um, access things. And, and you know, generally the government is gonna consider intent there for security, even for security researchers, I think. The government is gonna consider, you know, what was the intent in determining whether or not to prosecute um, and to prosecute a potential crime. Okay, so if the court's decision isn't gonna prevent a bad actor like Van Buren from accessing personal information, you know, if they have like access to it, do we need some new privacy legislation to protect data? Oh, that's such a good question. So, <laughs> so, so, so Jared just got into some of this. Let, let, me, let me say a few things about it. So um, the CFA is just an outdated statute. And so to the extent that uh, Congress was concerned about what hacking looked like in 1986, Despite the fact that there have been fair a number of amendments, it's not clear to me that it covers the use cases that might matter, and and so I think that there might be room for improvement there. Uh, and I know I'm not alone in that view. Although I think that by Jared said this at the up, uh, out front, by clarifying this question um, about what counts as authorization or exceeds authorization, um, it, it has it has put a lot of more sanity into the statute. Um, in terms of understanding it. Um, but there are still, this is one of the reasons I keep um, being the drum about, you know, this is, this is one aspect of a statute that doesn't, is not the final word on protection of data is because of the kinds of technical and organizational and administrative protections that should already be part of, say, good hygiene in an organization. So whether you're trying to prevent or minimize the possibility of outside hackers or inside threats, um, you're, you're, going, you're not going to be relying on the CFAA for that. You're going to be relying on good security hygiene, on training employees, um, on making sure that you have, I think Jared said, multi-factor authentication is one way, but you can also be looking at different kinds of industry standards, NIST, ISO, whatever, good robust protocols internally that people actually follow that are updated. Um, I think that's, that's really important. I think we really shouldn't forget that the question of access is often a technical question. So it, it's a, I think it's a real problem that companies run into when they have anybody in the organization who can have access to all the organization's data. That's just a terrible practice. Not, not, because, not only because of the insider threat, um, but because of, the, of the, the data breach threat or the hacking threat, which is you know, if somebody in the, in the outside of the organization gets access to any part of the network, they're going to have access to everything. And so you're going to need to create, or, or good practice is usually to create um, um, uh, silos so that people, uh, if you have access to one thing because you're in HR, say, it doesn't mean that you have access to everything else. Um, you know, I, I work at a law firm. We have deal in privileged and confidential information all the time. I don't have access to every client's files, um, and, and nor should I, and it would be a real risk if I did. And let's not forget terms of service, privacy policies, contracts, they're all still enforceable instruments or potentially enforceable instruments, kind of privacy policies may or may not be, um, that, that can be used in various ways. Privacy policies themselves can be enforced by the FTC or by state AG's agencies in various contexts. So organizations are not without recourse um, and they're not without methods of being able to mitigate bad conduct. Um, and it, I don't think the CFA was ever gonna be the tool I don't think it ever really has been the tool uh, to make sure that this kind of conduct doesn't occur. But now it clearly isn't um, it isn't the tool. But there are many, many others. Jared, do you, do you feel the same way? Yeah, I do. You know, to go back to your question about should there be new laws, I mean, I, I do think that it leaves it leaves open. I mean, you have 
because what Van Buren did should be a crime. Um, you know, he took a bribe to access a confidential government database and provide that information. I mean, it was a sting operation. Nobody was actually under threat, but like the, you know, his conduct should be a crime. And, um, and in that case, he, I believe he was charged with, with honest services fraud. And that, that decision was overturned because the Supreme Court has had, you know, separate issues with, uh, with sort of white collar crime and defining that. And then, um, and then he was charged with a violation of the CFAA, and that now no longer applies to him. So I think it does leave open for Congress to say, okay, the, the, you know, we now have, we've now clarified, the court has clarified the CFAA is basically inside hacking and, and outside hacking. It's really a hacking statute, but we need some protection for real insiders. I mean, you can imagine, um, you know, in the voting context that, you know, so this handles sort of outside hacking of voting systems, but but you know if you were to bribe an insider, um, then there's not it's not entirely clear. I mean, you would try to sort of cobble together a, a criminal statute from because there's a lot of criminal statutes out there, but but it's not really clear that that is a crime specifically a crime. Um, and and when you have sort of an insider misusing information uh, and and. You know, and, and Congress would need to talk, but I mean, that's going to be difficult to determine because, you know, misusing company information, maybe you don't want that to be a crime, but misusing, um, you know, misusing government data or, or uh, you know, changing votes, obviously, things like that, that an insider would do, somebody who has access, um, you know, those type of things I think should be, you know, should be criminalized. I agree. See, you mentioned a little bit earlier that the Supreme Court left open the question of whether the law requires circumvention of a technological access barrier or could include overstepping limits contained in contracts or policies. But you didn't say what you thought it should be. Like, do you, how would you like to see that narrowed? You know, it's actually it's a really interesting question. I think it's going to be it's going to be, you know, my view is that there, there can be certain policies and contracts but it, it should be very clear in terms of what is limited and what's not. I mean, you, you don't want to have, um, you know, accidental overstepping. But on the other hand, you know, if, if the, you know, if the file says, you know, confidential employment documents do not access and you nonetheless access it, even though it's not password protected, I think that that, you know, you are trying to get access to something um, that you're not supposed to be, be in and is off limits. And it's just, you know, it's now, from a from a good corporate uh, you know cybersecurity hygiene perspective, that's bad practice. But it would be just the same if there's a filing cabinet with employee you know confidential employee documents, and I go and pull those. I mean the the you know getting access to information, even if it is not sort of a code based um, prevention, if it is clear that I'm that that is off limits and I'm not supposed to be there. I, you know, my personal view is that I think that there should be some limit there, but I think that that's going to, it's going to depend in, in part on terms of the, you know, what the policies are and how clear they are in terms of what is off limits and what's, what's within sort of within the bounds. Um, because what you don't want is to say, oh, well, you know, everything's off limits except what is and, and, you know, have that be unclear. Because what, you know, I think the, the computer, the, the cybersecurity researchers that, you know, they, there want, you want to have some clarity. If you're going to overstep the line and, and commit a criminal act, you need there to be some clarity there. And I think that's one thing that the court made clear um, and that, you know, I think should be the case, that there is clarity in terms of when you are actually, you know, breaking the law. So for a computer uh, security researcher waking up, you know, the day after this, this decision was made, what's different for them? I think their risks are lower. Um, but... But that's it. I mean, I, I mean, I think I think that the the truth is there's still all sorts of things to be thinking about, right? You still need to be thinking about um, terms of service. You still need to be thinking about policies. You still should be thinking about to what extent is cooperative engagement important. Um, but the thing that you don't have to be thinking about anymore is, am I going to violate the CFAA uh, if I'm not? Uh, accessing a computer system without authorization. And I want to make one thing very clear. Um, th there is a distinction in the law. This has nothing to do with Van Buren. There is a distinction in the law between computers and files. The law um, uh, creates violations around access or unauthorized ac ac um, 
unauthorized access of computers. It doesn't say the same thing about files. And there's case law that talks about this, this distinction that um, appears to be, and the, the Supreme Court hasn't opined on this, um, but appears to be in the direction of if you're accessing, if you have access to a system, um, but not necessarily to a file, and you're, you're able to obtain the file, that that's not a CFAA violation. So, um, so something I, something I want to I make sure is clear, but waking up after Van Buren, the number of risks you have to think about are fewer, I think. I, I agree that they're fewer because you no longer, you know, it's not no longer the case that you have to worry that, you know, some violation of a term of service is going, you know, uh, particularly a term of service on purpose is going to be, um, it's going to be a criminal violation or violation from CFAA. You do, I mean, the, um, you know, some of the examples provided for, uh, you know, some of the research done, and I'm not a, you know, a, a computer security expert, but, you know, some of the examples provided of like, um of things that are done including like breaking into experian and, and downloading the data to show that there's a risk or a vulnerability if you're breaking past a code uh, you know a, a a gate a code gate there or you know for, you know hacking a password getting access to documents that you shouldn't have access to I, I do think that the court makes very clear that that is and and much clearer than the the statute itself um which you know was had a lot of sort of lack of clarity uh, but the court makes very clear how that's going to apply. If it's off limits and you're accessing it, then that's then that's a violation of the CFAA. And I, I, so I think that that's you know that's something for a computer researcher to keep in mind is that you know breaking through code walls, even if your purpose is is noble, um, is going to be you know is going to be a violation of the CFAA. Now again, it comes down to you know whether or not you're going to be prosecuted for it and and that. But uh, I think the safest bet for uh, you know, for researchers and others is to is to work with you know work with the companies to to identify any any security vulnerabilities and and do that in a way that that uh you know that that works with people to try and make you know all of our infrastructure safer so should we try and get around this by just asking every company to have a bug bounty program yeah i i do think i mean that it is a good it's a good idea um you know we've seen we've seen it work in practice that um you know that you can have these type of programs and that they work they identify a lot of bugs and and i think that you know it is good practice and, and one of the things i mean you know votes in, in terms of elections you know they're the, the end customer is just as interested in in making sure that the you know the the systems are safe and i think that's true and we're, we're seeing that too in in all of these data breaches that they're they're resulting in you know penalties to the companies that are breached because and and you know lawsuits against the companies that are breached there is a significant interest in security and in cybersecurity here and i think that it is you know for companies they should be doing bug bounty programs they should be doing um you know having security researchers test their systems and uh you know and, and need to be uh, bored about that because they're going to be exposed to liability um, or, or horrible press too, if, if they, you know, if they're, if they are subject to a breach. I, I will say in answer to the question, I, I agree with Jared in the sense of it can reduce liability. Um, I am, uh, I'm not in the policy business, so I tend to be pretty careful about not making suggestions on what's a good idea or not in part, just because I represent a lot, as Jared does, lots of clients with different kinds of interests. Um, but I do think that having that kind of program can absolutely reduce liability um, because even though risks are lower post Van Buren, they're not zero. Um, and, you know, just as much as we've been talking about the importance of the Van Buren decision in clarifying the scope of the CFAA, it does not answer all of the questions in this space. So what do you think this ruling can maybe tell us about what's coming up in the future? Get your crystal ball out. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll take that. So, um, Van Buren did a great job of of clarifying uh, an important issue that had split the circuits. Um, there are other issues uh, that the CFAA um, still has. So again, a lot of, a lot of questions in the in the Q and A about about mens rea and intent, and and I do think that there are some open questions about what counts as knowing an intentional conduct to harm or commit fraud or whatever the specific provision might be. 
you know, again, as Jared mentioned, this is the first Supreme Court case to weigh in on the CFAA. There are lots of other questions that are available to the court. I don't expect, actually, Jared and I were talking about this yesterday in preparation for this. Um, you know, uh, now that the courts clarified this issue, um, I think it's rented to, to, to the view that uh, it's unlikely that anybody's going to do anything. Uh, that we're, in other words, it's unlikely that Congress is going to do anything. It's unlikely that the court's going to step in again. Um, it, this is just going to keep playing out in lower courts for a long time. Um, and, and I think this question of intent might, might end up be, uh, being a very important one. Um, I also think that um, there are still open questions around things like what I pointed out with the, the Eastern, Eastern District of Pennsylvania case. You know, it, it, what, 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 are the, what are the questions around technical access? I think, I think that those are open questions that are going to be litigated and that are going to end up being very, very important. Um, and that are going to play out for, for some time. That, those are my views. Yeah, and I agree. I think that we're not, it's been 35 years or some odd since, uh, since the CFA was adopted before the Supreme Court took up a case. I don't think we're going to start seeing, you know, a regular uh, caseload on it. But I, I do think that, um, that we are going to see some of these issues play out in the lower courts. I think, though, that, I mean, generally when you get a, a decision like this, which establishes a real black line rule, um, then it doesn't lead to as much litigation over it or, or, or um, you know, sort of uh, follow on cases. So I, I think by, by laying out that really clear ruling, um, you know, you're not going to see a lot on this, but as Chris mentioned, I mean, there's a lot of other issues and, and what, you know, the Supreme Court even specifically noted um, the, the issue of the code wall versus, versus contracts and others that, that is going to have to play out in the lower courts. And I think it's going to play out in the lower courts over the next decade or so before the, the Supreme Court really takes it up again. Might be out of date by the time they make <laughs> the next decision. Oh, well, um, considering it's already out of date, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to take a look at um, some of the questions that people have been sending in now? So let's just jump on the chat. Um, we've had one here. Jump in, either one of you wants to take it. Is the relative lack of thorough guidance for trial courts reflective of inherent ambiguity in the statute's wording or simply of the lack of trial court experience in eight of the nine justices? Courts are often, appellate courts, Supreme Court, among them are often faced with the question of how far should they go in terms of answering the question that's in front of them. I clerked for a judge on the Third Circuit, and he was very clear that, that unless there was a case where um, the trial courts really needed to have a roadmap, um, that the, we were only going to answer the question in front of the court um, and let the courts figure out the rest as they come up. And the reason is that um, judges can often be concerned about overreaching and creating a mess that they didn't intend to create. By trying to clarify the law, they actually create a bigger problem. And this does happen a lot. Different judges feel differently about it. Um, so I think that there's, there's a lot of that institutional way of thinking about what the role of a judge is. Um, the other thing is that this was, a, this was a contested, it was a split decision, right? Um, and there was a dissent. Um, and there's a lot of talking to each other between the majority and the dissent. Um, and so what that means is that there were lots of drafts that were being shared um, between the clerks um, and, the, and the justices um, as they were trying to hammer out their positions and their arguments. And anybody who deals with a negotiated document is, has the experience of having a document in the end that has ambiguities and that doesn't have everything that you want because you're trying to stitch together an agreement. So um, I do think that there are issues with the statute as there are with most statutes. It's not the clearest. Um, and certainly after 35 years of use, it's, it's uh, uh, not necessarily um, easy to apply. Um, but I also think that there's the reality of courts feeling the institutional pressure to not overreach and also having to negotiate among themselves. I also think just among Supreme Court cases, this is actually one that provides more clear guidance than, than a, a lot of Supreme Court cases. Um, in this case, I mean, the, the court sets a bright line rule of what is in and what is out. 
um, regarding the CFAA. And, and I think that that's going to be very useful for trial courts and in interpreting, okay, well, if the prosecution is brought and it's based on, you know, purpose and, uh, and policies, that's going to be out. And, and so, whereas you have some Supreme Court cases where, you know, everything is a very circumstance driven test and, and, um, you know, you're trying and the Supreme Court itself has difficulty determining one way or the other. In this case, it sort of makes it a little clearer. I do think that, you know, the, the, um, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the justices don't have a lot of trial court experience and, or don't have any trial court experience as judges. Um, a lot of them were counsel, uh, you know, they were practicing attorneys before that and worked in the lower courts. But, um, but they also uh, don't have a lot of computer experience. I mean, you know, a lot of these justices are in their 70s, 80s. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I know when I, I clerked on, uh, on the Fifth Circuit and, and there were certain judges that they still, they had their emails printed. They did not use a computer. Uh, when I was when I was on the court, I, I uh, you know they've retired by now, but you know judges are not known, and the justices are not known for their technical technical savvy, and so you know they tried to create a bright line rule here um, in a and in a sort of an area of law that they are not particular experts in. I mean that's one of the reasons we we put in the amicus briefs is to sort of educate the court. On these areas of law that the court and and on areas of, of sort of personal practice. I mean, how how um, you know security researchers work and how voting systems work and all of that uh, that the court is just not going to be experienced with. Um, so that's yeah, that's my my sort of view there. And and I do think that this will provide you know pretty significant guidance for trial courts in terms of doing this. I do think it let you know the court left a lot of issues to be determined, and but that happens in virtually every case because what the court really wants to do is answer the question before it and not, you know, ruling on the, so the code-based barriers say, and, and on some of this would, you know, it gets beyond the case before it and, and starts getting into sort of advisory and policy making uh, that the court really wants to be careful about getting into. Do you think they struggle because they are still trying to take laws made for the physical world and apply them to the digital world? I, I definitely think that that's a struggle we see over and over again in court. So um, you see this a lot in the social media space, actually, where uh, issues about speech and, um, uh, and harm uh, come up. Um, and so what you see in the case law in a, in a number of different areas around, around the, the virtual space is application of very old, centuries old common law ideas. Um, onto these spaces. And it's hard, like graphing is hard, but it's also something that the courts have been doing for a long time. Um, you know, one, I, could, I could talk about this all day, but you, know, you could look at 19th century American jurisprudence, looking at the railroad and industrial revolution and applying pre-industrial law to those spaces. We had this explosion of creativity that came out of that. I think we're kind of seeing the same thing now, but now we live in a world, unlike in the 19th century, where most areas of art are determined by statute. So we're sort of in, in the state where we're, we're waiting for Congress, also the states to intervene in some way. So I think in summary, guys, we've kind of determined that it's made things a little bit clearer, but it's still <laughs> fairly murky out there. And that um, cooperation between researchers and companies is gonna be the best way forward. Um, we've underline that companies can't create criminal liability through terms of service, which is important. So it's lowered the risk for security researchers, but there's still reason for them to tread carefully, right? So there's still some risks there. Um, and also that there's no reason why companies should stop their uh, good practices anyway of restricting access. I mean, are there any other summary points that you guys would like to add to this discussion today? you know, the court can can do what it does. But the real, you know, the real threat for um, for security is people who are not actually don't actually care about the CFAA and don't actually care about being criminals. Right. And so, um, you know, while the, the while we talked a lot here about what is the CFAA, you know, prohibit and, and what you know, what is it criminalized? You know, the companies need to, um, you know, of all sorts need to make sure that their data is protected and that their systems are protected and, and really use the sort of best practices that, that uh, you know, Chris and others have, uh, have advocated um, for, all, for all of what they do in order to, to protect our critical infrastructure. Yeah, and I would say that um, th this does 
this does clarify a question that can allow, especially researchers, white hats, um, and any anybody looking for uh, looking at public information or information that's accessible through the internet. It does offer clarification, but it it doesn't um, it doesn't mean that the picture is really that clear anyway. I mean, you still have you still have a number of obligations and a number of ways of thinking about what restrictions are out there, even if the CFAA's authorization prong is not one of them. Thank you so much, guys. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you both today, and I hope you enjoyed it, uh, everyone that was watching at home. And yeah, if you didn't get your question answered, please send them in, and votes will do their best to get those questions answered for you on their YouTube channel. So yeah, that's uh, thank you very much and goodbye from us.